Eddie, so I'm a former sysadmin. These days I work at Google in network operations, managing several uh, obscenely large networks. Um, so that's, that's my background. I used to be a systems guy, these days more networks. Uh, before I get in the talk, I'll give two very quick plugs. Um, we're hiring, yeah, of course. Uh, the one talk, since everybody seems to have plugged a talk in the main conference, the one talk you should see in the main conference, if especially managing distributions is something you have to care about, is Mark Merlin's talk on migrating the Google production fleet from you wouldn't believe it if I told you to something less horrible. Um, <laughs> go see it. Uh, if you conflict, the slides from a previous version of that talk are actually available. Alrighty, so this talk unfortunately needs a disclaimer. What I'm giving is general information. It's tainted by my personal preferences and those who've ever had beer with me will know I have my personal preferences. Um, every single slide could be a full day presentation. It's, there's a lot here. The nuances are heavy. Um, yeah. So ultimately the whole premise of this talk is a very simple question. What is quality of service? It is deciding which packets to drop during congestion. Nothing more, nothing less. If you don't have any congestion, you don't get any benefit. Now, there's a big difference here between not thinking you have any congestion and not actually having any congestion. If you don't monitor your network heavily, and in fact, much hardware doesn't let you know. Um, shout out to Arista Hardware here that made a nice point of actually letting you monitor some of the internals at a very low level that let you actually answer that question. And if you can't differentiate packets, you have no benefit. If you can't decide which data you want to drop, well, you have to drop something, so you're just dropping at random and then you're back where you were. Um, there's another thing that people link in with this, which is various rate limiting and assigning certain amounts of bandwidth. Ultimately, all you're doing is causing congestion earlier. You may wish to do this. There are valid reasons to do it. But, yeah. And, of course, the reason Quals doesn't work on the internet as the wider global network is simply because you can't differentiate packets. Uh, this also gets into the whole fun with network neutrality. So, how does it work? In a very simple case, it's two things. First, you assign traffic to a traffic class. Now, as I said before, you've got to have more than one because otherwise you're not differentiating. Uh, there's bits in most protocols, IP, MPLS, Ethernet, IPv6, etc., to assign to mark traffic classes. Uh, generally, this is what you would actually do in the core of your network where you can trust the data where on the edge of your network where you might not say trust a workstation, not to say everything is super high priority, you might filter. Um, and then yes, at the edge, you use ACL filters to do this. Uh, on most commercial gear, it's almost exactly the exact same ACL process used for everything. You simply say, instead of the action being accept this packet, reject this packet, it's tag it with this quals profile. And then to each traffic class, you assign bandwidth and queue sizes. Uh, depending on the platforms, there's also some priority shaping on backplanes, but at that point, you're spending a couple of hundred thousand dollars a box, and you can hire someone to answer that for you. Um, so this is where I said before, you may limit queues by bandwidth, you may limit queue size by uh, the queue size in buffers. So congestion, I said before, if you don't have congestion, you're not really doing anything. Congestion is an attempt to send data above line rate. Generally, this is simply a case of two ports come into a switch and both want to, both want to leave a third port. Uh, you can get other fun cases. Um, if you happen to be de dealing with long long haul transport. You can have your links being coded over Sonnet, which has a slightly lower data rate than Ethernet at 10 gigabit. 
you might have carriers that have their own monitoring traffic on a data circuit you purchase that lowers it. You might think you've got a 100 meg circuit, but actually have a circuit that's 100 meg defined by Ethernet frame sizes, not IP payload contents, which always get your, ca your uh, contracts checked, by the way, for this sort of thing. That's congestion. That's it. Now, because this will always happen, we expect two packets to arrive for the same destination port. We buffer. Um, for those of you that remember the distinction uh, popular in the fast D days of cut through versus store and forward Ethernet switching, uh, all I'm talking about, these buffers are the store and forward part. And after some time, they, they fill up. The buffers can only be so large. And they block new packets. And this we call tail dropping. There are other ways to do things than just tail dropping. Again, that's another whole day or more. And that's actually what we care about. It's the point at which we drop packets that we have the problem. But realistically, the point we dropped the packet was guaranteed at the point the buffer started actually filling up. The point at which there's more traffic to, we want to go out than is capable. A little bit of time, sure. Long time, bad. So on systems using quads, these buffers are generally sliced per queue, which actually reduces the amount of time these, these buffers can fill up. This is actually a really important concept. If you can say this 10% of my traffic is really important, this 90% is crap, if you've got hardware that can only slice buffers evenly, that can actually be really bad. Um, if you've done all this work to slice your, your traffic and 100% of it is this high priority class, all you've done is guaranteed that that high priority class is going to get dropped more often than it would have before because it no longer has as much buffer space. Um, buffer slicing is changing. There's a design technology called virtual output queuing, which is used on a bunch of uh, large multi-terabit routers and switches these days. Again, that's a whole day's talk. Um, Brocade MLX uses it, Juniper's PTX uses it. I'm sure there's others. Those just happen to be two I know of. So all, a lot of things actually come down to buffer size here. And there are some devices that have buffers so small that enabling quads is almost a guarantee of causing a problem even if you've got the best guy in the planet configuring it. Um, Cisco's 2960 series, really common here, about every month or two on one of the main Cisco operators lists. Someone pipes up with, we're having problems with these drops on our network. Are you running 2960s and have quads enabled? Yes, there you go. This is not bad for what they're designed for. The 2960s are perfectly reasonable. If you're using them in a congested environment in a data center, not so good. Um, some devices, on the other hand, have buffers so large you need the quad slicing of the buffers slicing, uh, sizing to avoid buffer bloat. There are the large boxes that I work with most of the time, big Juniper T series, the Cisco um, CRSs are much the same. They're all much the same. Have buffers on the order of a gigabyte or more per port. This is also why they're so expensive, because that RAM is at 100 gigabit throughput or more. And without slicing it, you end up with buffers of 100 milliseconds or more. And if you've got congestion, all that means is you just added 100 milliseconds latency and dropping later. You actually, um, again, look into the buffer bloat discussions if you want more background here. And some devices are just horrible. And I call out the Cisco Catalyst 6500 here <laughs> simply because there is a great document somewhere on the web which is a list of all the quasi attributes of pretty much every major piece of networking hardware on the planet. It's a couple of pages long. They separated out the Catalyst 6500 because it alone is the same length as the rest of that document. You can do the CAT 6500 right, but you need to know what you're actually doing. You need to know down to the ver subversion level what hardware you've got in there. You need to know what line card mix you've got in there. You need to know which f forwarding cards you've got. 
You need to know which version of the chassis you've got. All that matters. Um, I would like to call those boxes obsolete, but there's a lot of them out there and that will never happen, sadly. Um, but again, all this comes down to you need to know what you've got out there. You need to know what's in your network, what's in your hardware. This gets even worse when you consider that many people will buy their WAN from a third party. Most of us don't have enough money to just dig fibre on the ground wherever we want. And your carrier will not tell you down to this information. You might know, I mean, I know broadly what platforms several of the major, I mean, Telstra, Optus, Level 3 in the US, for example. I happen to know what hardware they generally use. But I certainly don't know how they're configured, how it affects me. So when you're configuring this slicing, a couple of very simple general rules. When you're configuring for low latency, you're configuring very small buffer lengths, and this means you get more frequent drops. If you're configuring for high throughput, you have large buffers with fewer drops. But you've got more introduced latency. In practice, of course, you balance this. Um, there's a fun, pro, uh, fun issue that actually results in a lot of this discussion called, of something called microbursts. Um, this is most commonly known in return path of multicast traffic, where one packet is sent almost exactly at the same time to many hosts who then individually acknowledge, causing a nice distributed denial of service attack straight back at the source. So there's fun things where you might deliberately slow, have high speed links on clients, low speed links on servers, all sorts of oddball things. And this comes down again to knowing what you've got. Uh, for those of you that run software routers, so anyone that's using Linux, anyone that's looking at the various software defined networking where the edge of that part of the network is a software, is a Linux box, configure something, buffer sizes, are all config options, basically. You can and really should configure them. Um, given that it's probably a Linux-based thing, look at the Zero Work project, which is a dev project coming out of the uh, Buffer Bloat group again, where they d basically took open work and tried to fix everything they could find to fix buffer and cause problems. Um, I'll just give you a very quick one. Traffic classes, there's some conventions. There's a convention that you have a network control class that is the highest priority. No traffic outside the network should ever be classified this way. You don't put DNS, you don't put SSH in network control. BGP, LLDP, spanning tree, those go in network control. Um, high priority traffic, um, assured forwarding, or AF is the general nomenclature. Sometimes numbers, sometimes extra names. So high prior and low pry, everything else goes in a best effort class. Um, I love this industry, best effort means no effort, rock on. <laughs> and you may consider having something called a scavenger class for your very low priority or very loss tolerant traffic that some guy torrenting to his laptop is actually higher prior priority than this traffic. Um, now, of course, you might actually enforce that somewhere else. And a lot of people here would then go, but what about VoIP? Because that's commonly given as the justification for doing a lot of this work. Everybody who's ever used Skype has demonstrated that you do not need specific quality of service for voice over IP. Just because your vendor's implementation is shit <laughs> does not mean the broad technology is shit. Now, there might be some sense in identifying them separately for monitoring, performance monitoring analysis purposes. There is no inherent need for quality of service, even on a network that has other traffic. And that's got five queues, which is probably more than you need. A control traffic, a high pry and a low pry, or a high pry and a best effort, is probably enough for very many networks especially if you cannot identify every single flow in your network, what the source and destination is, why it's there, and why the business cares about it, you probably don't, can't go to that full effort. But you might be able to say put DNS and a couple of those control traffics 
in a high prior IQ, which will help the user experience. Don't split a single TCP session up between queues. Don't say acts are faster. <laughs> Don't do it. Um, so really a last comment. This really can be a benefit. Quas, as much as I said it's bad, it's horrible, it's dangerous, it really can help you. But you really need to employ or permanent contract people with any benefit. Don't, don't hire someone to deploy it and then just leave it there when your network changes, you start, you've deployed video that's caught as high priority traffic, breaking your files, sharing that actually matters. That's the sort of thing that's bad. Think and test carefully before any deployment. And thank you very much. You can come up and come <laughs>